Chairman, we're live. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Highways and Transport Cabinet panel, Tuesday, 13th of July, 2021, commencing at 10 a.m. Uh, just like to make an announcement, please. Uh, COVID-19. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the Council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. Cameras should be switched off if and when speaking to the meeting, but I would ask you perhaps to keep your cameras off to, so that we can protect bandwidth. Um, to indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raise hand function. Use of the meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. At the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain, and I'll declare the result after each vote. Officers are present at the meeting and will follow the same protocols. Breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours and other breaks will be incorporated as appropriate. Depending how long the meeting takes, uh, we possibly will have a, a half an hour lunch break around about 12 o'clock. Um, first of all, if I can ask um, members to introduce themselves and I'll take them uh, on the order that I've got. James? James Bond, not, a, not here. We're chasing him, Chairman. Thank you. Annie? Yes, good morning, Chair. I'm Annie Brewster, Conservative uh, member for Harpenden Rural and Vice Chairman of the County Council. Thank you. Uh, Richard? <coughs> We're also chasing him, Chairman. OK. Uh, Stephen Cavender? Uh, yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Steve Cavender. I'm the Liberal Democrat member for Meriden Tudor. <coughs> right, I'm here. I've just got to switch things on. Uh, morning, Paul Clark, uh, member for Hitchens South and Liberal Democrat. Okay. Stephen? Uh, morning, again. Stephen Charles Medhurst. Um, Liberal Democrat member for Central Watford and Oxy and Liberal Democrat group leader and highway spokesperson. Jeff. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Uh, uh, Councillor Jeff Jones, uh, Conservative member, Buntingford. Graham. Good morning, Chairman. Graham McAndrew, Conservative member, Bishop Salford, Drural. Deputy Executive Member, Highways and Transport. Rena. Good morning, my name is Rena Ranger. I am the Conservative County Councillor for Rickmansworth East and Oxy Park. Sarah. Good morning, Sarah Tallon, Conservative Councillor for London Colney. Okay. Morning, everyone. <clears throat> there are no substitutions and no apologies, although there's two of our number we're chasing up. Um, could I ask, please, members by show of hands to declare any pecuniary or declarable interest? There are none. Um, right, item one. Invite the pa I'm inviting the panel to agree the minutes of the meeting of the Highways and Transport Cabinet panel held on 15th of June 2021. Uh, is anyone in agreement as to their accuracy? Could you please vote? Uh, Chair, I put my hand up. OK, sorry, yeah. yeah just, uh, thank you, Chair. Stephen Giles met us uh, for the benefit of anyone watching. It was just that in paragraph 5.9, I don't think it actually reflected totally uh, the concern that uh, my group and I believe actually the Labour group also raised in relation to the potential restrictive policy on position statement one on on road street charges. So if that's just slightly amended in one of those bullet points that concern was raised about that policy, uh, I'd be more than content to agree the minutes. 
of what uh, amendment are you suggesting? <clears throat> well, in paragraph 5.9 on page 6, I have a suggested position statement 1. It says, require clarification of the criteria which would allow large-scale rollout of on-street EV charges to introduce in limited circumstances. Add at the end, uh, concern was expressed that this, this top potentially was a restricted policy by some members. I've got no problem with that. Can you, can you make that, Theresa? Yes, that can be done. Thank you. Any other comments? So if you could please vote on the accuracy of the minutes, please. OK, thank you. They were agreed. Item two, public petitions, the, none have been received. Um, item three, if I can introduce Andrew Highfield, head of integrated transport units to give an update on integrated transport unit, please. Hi. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everyone. I'm just going to set up sharing my screen. So let me just do that now. If anybody could let me know if they can't see that, but hopefully you can see the title page now on your screen. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Andrew Highfield, Head of the Integrated Transport Unit for, for Hertfordshire County Council. I'm going to outline three main themes this morning via a presentation. All of the content is for information only, and we will ensure the presentation is shared following this panel. Some of you may have seen a slimmed down version of this presentation at members induction. This one has a bit more detail in it, but it's still by way of introduction. The three main themes are number one, the main delivery aspects of the integrated transport unit and transport in Hertfordshire. Number two, the key challenges facing transport over the coming months. And number three, some of what we consider exciting projects and initiatives coming up and hopefully you all will agree. Officers of the integrated transport unit truly believe in a transport network that is easy to use, costs a fair price, is accessible to all, and gets you to where you want to go in a fast, safe, efficient way. Those elements will be an important theme as I set out some of the challenges and opportunities a bit further on in this presentation. I want to start by just outlining some of the key deliverables of the ITU on a day-to-day -day basis. The three main pillars of delivery for the ITU are the public bus network, adult care services transport and children's services transport. The public transport in, network in Hertfordshire is 90% commercial and 10% contracted. Our largest operators are Arriva and Uno. So why that 90-10 split? It's a pretty deregulated environment and HCC takes on contracted routes where commercial operators do not believe it's viable. A value for money score is then applied to identify the viability of HCC taking on such a service to provide journeys for social good purposes. There are a range of activities that the ITU provides on behalf of the bus network to ensure it grows and develops further. A number are listed here, but in summary, HCC provides a structure and environment for bus operators to flourish and provide an excellent service for customers. You may also spot on this slide that HCC will be taking on traffic commissioner powers from the Department for Transport, and I will explain a little later on the benefits of this approach. The ITU also delivers transport on behalf of other departments within HCC via an internal fleet and operation and contracts with local transport providers. There is also support via Dialeride membership scheme and community transport funding in collaboration with NHS clinical commissioning groups. And finally, the ITU enables five and a half thousand entitled children to access education every day through providing transport on dedicated small vehicles, bus and coaches or tickets to the public transport network. And I want to move on to the financial numbers that supports all of the activity I've just outlined. So the bus budget of two million pounds annually supports 97 of those services I've outlined where the commercial market does not feel it viable to run. 
Supporting these services ensures ongoing critical access for Hertfordshire residents to education, work and leisure opportunities. Offices conduct two tender rounds a year of contracted services, with contracts usually being given on a cost or subsidy basis. A cost-based contract is where HCC keeps the customer revenue and the operator get paid, gets paid a fixed sum. Subsidy is where the operator keeps a revenue and will likely have a lower overall contract cost. <coughs> HCC also supports the bus network through ticketing schemes, such as the English National Concessionary Scheme and Saver Cards. And it's great news that in the recent recovery funding announced by HCC, the Saver Card will be extended from 11 to 19 age groups through to 25, allowing 50% discounted bus travel for young adults. Officers are currently putting a plan in place to enable that extension. As I have outlined, the ITU delivers transport on behalf of children's services and adult care services. And as such, the budgets outlined here remain in those respective departments. The budgets listed here are made up of contracted transport for users. I next want to highlight some of the key challenges facing transport in Hertfordshire currently. Starting with the bus network, undoubtedly there is a key question on demand for services as further restrictions in society are removed. Some of our operators are confident that demand will be buoyant. However, it is a key challenge, especially around the messaging of safety on public transport. A key challenge is also not only the volume of customers returning, but in total, but how they wish to travel. With the change in work patterns and increased working from home, the profiles of customer demand will ultimately change. So what does that mean in practice? In our current structure, operators may find some routes difficult to continue, but they also might identify new routes for development. Our current approach is to invest time in a network review of how the network operates currently, find innovative data sets that can help guide us in changing demands, and ensure there is a bedrock to the bus network that allows new services to flourish and takes a fair approach to services that will struggle. For our adult care services transport, there is an ongoing challenge around the utilisation of vehicles, which are an HEC asset, and ensuring the maximum use of vehicles versus investment to ensure that our large fleet is sustainable for the future. And for school transport, we're fully reliant on the local small vehicle market. That does allow for competition and innovation, but also means we're fully tied into market forces. And when there is less competition, an increase in prices. A key opportunity I will come on to shortly is how we can unlock the potential of the vehicle assets HCC has to provide for school journeys as well as adult care services transport. Just moving on to school transport a little more, we're now heading obviously towards the end of the summer term and academic year. I think it's safe to say this academic year for school transport has been challenging. Going back to September 2020, officers were undertaking a fast paced plan, utilising funding from central government to ensure students could utilise transport to access education. Officers analysed, planned and procured 76 extra duplicate buses onto the bus network to boost capacity, working to really tight high pressure deadlines. Officers also work collaboratively across the council and with commercial partners to ensure communication channels were utilised fully and the transport network was linked into other measures such as active travel and travel demand management. The other key initiative was that officers utilised some of the HCC internal fleet, which I've mentioned traditionally has been used solely for adult social care purposes, to provide some transport for students where possible. So like most other areas, school transport has seen a year like no other, and officers are now working on the planning for September 2021. A key concept for us in the ITU is total transport. So this is a concept that has been around for a few years now, and at its heart look, looks at how commissioned and other transport services can work for different customers, whilst being as efficient as possible behind the scenes. The main services are on here. All of these services provide for customers who will not be able to easily access a public transport network to get them to where they want to go. That means that traditionally they have all been contracted and delivered in relative isolation from each other. However, for the customer, their access to education, work opportunities, health appointments, and to reduce social isolation is still vital for the community. So everyone's still trying to crack this, but the concept of total transport is at the heart of how the ITU is trying to pursue initiatives that will link and integrate these sorts of transport services. So taking that concept and applying it to HCC, you get these sort of current and future state models you can see on this slide. So on the left, currently services, service users go via a very specific path depending on the referral process. So if you can imagine in St Albans, for example, you could have four vehicles travelling down the same road with service users for a HCC day centre, a voluntary day centre, dial a ride or in a taxi, as well as students travelling to school in taxis and small vehicles. So the future state you can see on the right proposes that routes are planned more geographically 
with all users being placed into the general same grouping, utilising the potential of a vehicle and filling spare seats before moving on to the next vehicle. This will enable better utilisation of the capacity of the vehicles that HCC operates, as well as potentially freeing up some vehicles for children's services transport, hence reducing our contracted spend. I will just caveat here that we are not looking at students and adults sharing transport at this stage, that will still be separated. Two projects that link into that that the I2 is currently leading on, which aims to deliver against the total transport concept in this future state model. So the first project is Community Connections Transport Optimization Pilot, or CCTOP for those who like an acronym. This pilot is in collaboration with Adult Care Services, and the aim is to leverage demand responsive technology that I will talk about in more detail shortly to plan and optimise journeys delivered through the HCC fleet. The pilot will initially focus on Decorum and St Albans, where there are 22 vehicles that HCC owns and operates. All of the current service users in that area will be planned via the technology, with routes being checked and validated by subject matter experts. The overall measures of success are listed. They fit into three categories, financial savings, quality improvements and time savings. The second project is a school transport optimization tool. HCC has not utilised planning technology for a number of years for the over 3,000 children who are transported on small vehicles each day. The tool we are investing in will allow us to plot pick up addresses and identify how routes can be better planned and students can be placed on vehicles to minimise vehicles on the road and contract costs. The aims of this tool are broadly similar to CC Top, where we hope to deliver financial efficiencies through better planning, improve the quality for school children on transport and save time for officers when planning contracts. And I want to move on to see some key opportunities and exciting initiatives we have coming this year and beyond on the bus network. So the first is demand responsive transport with DRT. DRT is a transport service focused on responding to customer demand and taking customers from A to B within a service zone without the need for a fixed bus route. The ITU on behalf of HCC bid for £1.4 million of DFT funding earlier this year and were one of 17 local authority areas successful. The bid was built on a defined service zone in North East Hearts based around Buntingford, with six key hubs just outside the service zone. North East Hearts has traditionally been an area where fixed bus routes have struggled and the commercial market has not flourished. The DRT service aims to create a modal shift from car use, encourage access to health, employment and schools and reduce social isolation. The DRT service will be launched later this year with three vehicles in operation. This will then move up to five vehicles from year two to year four. The pilot has a four year span to demonstrate effectiveness and for the ITU to learn more its operation working with a tech and operating partner. DRT technology has rapidly advanced over the past two to three years. Most technology providers have a version of the customer and driver app. The customer will book a journey within the defined service zone and the technology will then build a virtual bus route and direct the customer to the nearest defined stop for their pickup. The driver app will build the route for the driver to follow. The back office system will give the ITU an incredible granularity of data on where demand is, how customers are travelling and how utilised the services. This will allow quick analysis and tweaking where necessary to improve the service. Offices in the ITU have started to engage with officers and others at district level involved in the service zone. Some briefing material has been sent out to local members and some of you on the panel. And members will be invited to a briefing and Q&A with officers in late July for more detail on the scheme. The final opportunity I wanted to outline is the bus network and bus back better. This is the title of the new national bus strategy published by the DFT around two months ago. The strategy aims to make buses a mode of choice on the road and aims to do this through buses being more frequent, more reliable, easier to understand, cheaper to use and better coordinated. This offers each local authority in England an opportunity to set out its ambition for how they believe the bus network can achieve the aims of the strategy. And this is through two key pieces of work. The first is an enhanced partnership. This is a statutory mechanism that establishes a firm working relationship between the local authority and local bus operators. It is, excuse the pun, the vehicle through which change and ambition can be delivered. The aim of an EP is to increase dialogue, set joint strategies and initiatives and solve problems together in a collaborative spirit. Now, at this stage, most of the local authorities are scratching their heads about how to form an EP. The DFT has set an ambitious timeline to have the partnership set up. Thanks to the hard work of officers in the ITU, HCC was the first local authority to set up an EP in 2020, and that means one of the big hurdles has been navigated. As I mentioned earlier, the EP will also allow HCC to take on traffic commissioner responsibilities, and we'll be completing that move from August 1st, 2021. 
Taking on these powers allows HCC closer oversight over new bus service registrations and allows us to work with local operators to streamline processes and improve partnership working. It will also allow us to work more closely with bus operators on timetable changes and how this affects customer information and provision. The second key piece of work is a bus service improvement plan. This is a key document that sets out the ambition for the bus network. It can unlock a share of funding part of up to three billion pounds initially, and will set out how Hertfordshire believes bus services can improve and grow in key areas such as network provision, infrastructure, bus priority, ticketing and marketing. Work is now underway on the engagement and planning for this document and offices in the ITU will be sharing more details with you all over the coming months. A vital component of the bus service improvement plan and bus strategy requested by the Department of Transport is bus priority. So bus priority as outlined in this table gives tremendous benefits to the reliability and efficiency of the bus network, enabling better customer service and increased patronage. On the flip side, a lack of bus priority can create the conditions for a cycle of poor reliability, worsening customer service and decreased patronage, reducing the commercial viability of some routes. Offices have been delivering some minor but vital bus improvement work over the past year and are now into year two of an initial four year programme. The first two years have been focused on ensuring the bus network and stops and shelters meet all current accessibility requirements and approximately 100 stops and shelters have been upgraded. Work has also started at three locations in recent weeks to convert shelters to living garden shelters to support our green ambitions. The aim is for future shelters to be installed with living gardens as a mandatory design feature. The focus for bus priority now turns to bigger ticket items that as a table I showed a minute ago demonstrates can offer tremendous benefits to those who need or wish to use a bus as their primary method of transport. Work to improve the reliability of the Route 306 is currently going through consultation stages with the aim of enhancing the corridor between Watford and Bushy. This is a really important milestone as a first route to be identified within the structure of the enhanced partnership with a, with a reciprocal agreement being worked up with the operator to further identify how bus priority can form part of a wider package of initiatives to improve the route. A number of feasibility studies have also been delivered to identify key bus priority measures in a number of towns. The measures identified have then been analysed and shared with offices and other teams to ensure consistency in approach with active travel schemes and other highway based improvements. The aim is to now package the measures identified together to form a longer term coherent programme for bus priority that can achieve both transformational but also incremental change for the reliability of routes. Detail for that will be worked out over the summer with a firmer high level programme to be developed for the delivery of the bus service improvement plan in the autumn. The final item I wanted to finish on is zero emission buses. The ITU on behalf of HEC have recently submitted an expression of interest for funding to deliver zero emission buses into Stevenage. The ZEBRA scheme, as it's called, Zero Emission Bus Regional Areas, is a DFT-led scheme to deliver 4,000 zero emission buses onto the roads of England outside of London by 2025. The expression of interest is the first part of a very challenging bidding process with other local authorities. The expression of interest had to be turned around from the initial guidance in a very short time frame, with the assessment criteria focused on ambition, defining the place, the ability to deliver, and the improvement to air quality and emissions. It has been stated that up to 34 other local authorities have submitted an expression of interest. The first tranche has approximately £150 million available, and it is likely that two authorities will be selected from a standard process that HCC has entered for. HCC entered for the standard process as if we are select selected to go through to the next stage, a full business case will need to be produced and submitted by January 2022. The DFT will then decide on which business cases to take forward to fund in this first tranche of funding. So the expression of interest that HCC have submitted is ambitious and will deliver a step change in the amount of zero emission buses in Stevenage and we hope act as a catalyst for further zero emission buses in the county. The expression of interest requests funding for 30 single decker buses, which is, if successful would remove 1700 tonnes of CO2 emissions a year. A fantastic ambition, I'm sure you agree, and we have fingers crossed for getting to the next stage. That is all from me, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, are there any questions? Any? Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Oh, I'm echoing. Is that all right? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, Andrew, just a couple of things um, 
on uh, uh, rural, more, more rural routes. <clears throat> um, obviously, LTP4 and all we keep saying is to get out of people's cars and to actually get on public transport or active travel. Um, not to be too specific to my, my area, but you'll probably know that we do have a Sunday bus service that is considered uh, it doesn't uh, reach the bar to be funded um, by uh, commercial companies. And at the moment, we actually have the stress every year of finding a way to fund that, you know, going to district council or whatever. Um, it's about £12,000 a year. If, is, are, are some of your plans going to look into what alternatives could happen with something like that? And are there lots of these around the county? I, if, if it's the only one, maybe we could do something about it. But if there are lots... Um, how do we address that? Because it is too stressful to be, you know, every year trying to rely on an administration um, at a district or borough to pick up that tab. So that's one thing. And the other thing is just um, a shout out to um, how sensible when Catherine Warrington School came online. Um, again, rural it's villages going into towns quite of, of, often the transport system is historic, it's been inherited and it's bonkers. But with a new one, it was able to be reviewed so schools could look at staggering start times. And with COVID and staggering start times, this might be an opportunity to relook at some of those satellites where uh, children are coming from villages to lots of different schools, lots of different buses, perhaps they could more come on the same bus but I say stagger the start times. Just a couple of thoughts there. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think on the first point, I know that there is a, a policy document that was agreed, I believe, in 2015, setting out how and when services would be funding funded through the value for money tool I mentioned for our contractor services. And um, one of the things we're doing at the moment that I mentioned is undertaking this network review um, with a consultancy at the moment to look at how the network currently operates and where the gaps and opportunities are to then also look at the policies we've currently got in place to see if any need to be reviews to sort of fit for the future with what the DFT are expecting as well. So I think Sunday services is a really tricky one, an important one, and um, because traditionally, like you mentioned, they've not been too commercially viable, but they do fulfill a really good social need purpose in terms of keeping the funding going. Um, I believe in the current policy guidance, Sunday services aren't something that is strictly funded, but I will double check the guidance and send that to you across by email if that's OK. Um, but we are looking to review that as we go forward and offer some recommendations. Yeah, thank you. I think just with changing times and the more we're expecting people to try, it's chicken and egg, isn't it? So that's a lot of that is uh, our comms and national comms in terms of uh, you know bus travel. So thank you. Thank you. Stephen, you had your hand up. It's gone down again. Are you wanting to speak? Y yes, please. I don't know what's happened there. I didn't take it down, but thank you, uh, Phil. Um, if, if that's OK. Yeah. Do you, do you want to come in now? Or have yeah. you had something else? No, no, yeah. a, a couple of things. Thank you, Andrew, for that interesting presentation. Uh, a couple of points of clarification and then just others that you might want to get back to me, maybe outside of the meeting. Uh, obviously, in Watford, there's the Arriva Click system that's been operating. From what you're explaining here, it's not dissimilar in terms of using an app and then it tells you where you pick the bus up and you actually book it to where you want to go. So obviously it doesn't read. Uh, so does what you're looking at in, in the other two districts to some extent mirror that just so I get some perspective here? Because obviously uh, if that's operated more widely across uh, the county, then I can see considerable benefits uh, for that in terms of on-demand buses. Um, is one point. You mentioned the 306, upgrade to 306 Watford to Bushy, and you also mentioned bus gates in Watford. I'm assuming at some stage in the not too distant future, there will be a discussion with the local members affected because uh, the 306 upgrade is welcome, but it was the first I'd heard of it was of this presentation because no one has yet contacted me and clear that will run through my division. Um, so as I, and Annie is quite right. It's at the historic routes, and I, I've raised it before, and that Phil may well sigh. Um, that you know, you get off the train at Bushy Station, but to get to Watford General Hospital, despite there being a new road to it, you have to get a bus into the town centre in Watford, 
and then a second bus to get to the hospital. That to me, is because it's based on historic routes rather than what actually should now be feasible. Uh, and finally, as we move out of, well, getting back to some form of normality, there's been the issue with bus routes that have been supported by some districts. I appreciate it's only a few now that support bus routes. Um, at the tail end of, of the day and, and the beginning of the morning, I speak for, from a Free Rivers experience, where we're funding, but those routes have not yet, haven't been running during the course of the last six months. Oh, do we now expect under the partnership that those routes will now go running? So, in fact, the, the issue with this was uh, they were funded in the morning so people could get to work and use the same bus route to get home. If you take one or other out, you force people back into a private car. And inevitably, these are low paid, uh, low paid workers that rely very heavily in getting to work at sort of seven in the morning. For what, what probably what is a, a low paid job. So I'd welcome some comments on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Giles Meadows. Yeah, um, on the first point, I think around the DRT and the Reva Click, I think the broad principles will be the same. It's the same sort of type of service. Um, obviously, at the moment when it's being set up, it's likely that it'll be a different app or, or booking system for what a Reva Click is. But I think part of the strategy and with the funding we have from the DFT, is to work out how we can create almost that seamless customer experience over the next few years if this on-demand technology really takes off because i think a lot of it's still in the development and proof of concept stage hence the funding um so i think that yeah principles are the same the way that the customer uses a service will be similar um and we'll obviously see how that plays off out from when we launch it later this year um, i think on the 306 route i'll go back to the program manager res responsible for our bus priority and check in terms of consultation um, an engagement with members. My understanding was that had been done, but I'll double check that definitely. I know that the traffic regulation order process is just finished, and I think the responses for that are being looked at now. And um, again, happy to share all of that detail with you as well if you've not seen it. And um, so I'll make sure that's done straight away. In terms of the historic routes, I think, yeah, going back to Councillor Brewster's point as well, the review that we're undertaking at the moment is really trying to look at basics of how we link up to hospitals places of employment, work, schools, and how the historic network links into the future network. You can imagine it's still a bit tricky trying to find those innovative data sets that show how life might be with work patterns post COVID. Um, but we're trying to get the best data we can to look at that and then work with our local bus operators to see where things might not be commercially viable in the future or where there are new opportunities. But we definitely welcome feedback on that as, as we get to that stage of sort of engaging on that as well. And I think the three rivers, I'll, I'll just take that outside of this meeting, if that's OK, just to have a look at the detail um, and try and get back to you with a response as soon as possible, if that's OK. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, three quick questions, I, I hope. Um, car sharing, um, where we're putting the pupils, you know, more than one in the car, that's fine. I, I understand the maximisation there. But what about the personal interaction? There be some. Will we be taking that into consideration? Obviously, some people don't get on with others for whatever reason. Um, it doesn't always make sense. Um, and yes, it's all very well using planning apps to say we're going from A to B to C and ending up at, at Z at the end of the day. Um, so are we taking personal issues into account? Um, the buses out of Stevenage, the 30 buses, the electric buses, will they be operating outside of Stevenage, with Stevenage as the hub? Uh, I come from Hitchin, so I have a vested interest. Uh, you know, but you've got towns like Hitchin, Letchworth, Bulldog, you know, all, all around. So it's will the buses be operating out of there? And when doing the timetables for the buses, this is the last question, will they be linked up with the train timetables? Because there's no point arriving at a station five minutes after the uh, fast train to um, London ha has gone, because that might uh, upset a few people. Uh, to, to be polite, uh, I know you know people like Govia and Thameslink are currently um, discussing or consulting on their changes, which is not helpful because that means it buggers all your work up. Sorry, that's a technical term. Um, so you know you, you get 
what you think is a sensible timetable, then the trains go and change it. So uh, thank you for your presentation as well and do appreciate it. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Yeah, yeah, just on those points, so individual children, there is already quite a well-established process, as you can imagine, with our children's services colleagues and um, looking at where there are cases of issues or personality clashes or individual needs not being met by sharing transport. And some individuals or students are placed on uh, individual transport for a time period to review that and see how it goes. So we'd follow those processes as we have now. Um, I think currently, and I'll, I'll have to check this, but I think currently our ratio is around three students on a vehicle. So it's looking at how there might be ways or means that we could increase that and with better utilisation and planning. A key consideration obviously is that, especially in our special education needs children, there is high levels of vulnerability and individual needs, and it is usually a home pickup. So that does increase the complexity of trying to uh, get students onto a vehicle and then get to the school so they're not on that vehicle too long. So there's a lot of different factors we need to take in. And I think the benefit of the technology we're looking to procure and use is that it's as good as what you put into it. So we can create all of these conditions for the technology to use. It wouldn't just be a case of saying there's 10 people here, plot how you get them. We can factor in how long it takes them to get onto the vehicle, what individual needs they have as well. So we'll definitely consider all of that. Um, I think in terms of Stevenage buses, Personally, we did want to be a lot more ambitious if we could, but we do have to work in partnership with local bus operators. And I can explain the detailed funding mechanisms outside this meeting, perhaps, but um, the operators in the area do have to put up quite a lot of funding to procure uh, some of the cost of these buses. It's not just all the money coming from the DFT, and sorry, I should have been a bit clearer on that. Um, so that meant we had to be very clear with what we could do with the amount of buses to also look at the place criteria and the deliverability because obviously a big part of this is also the infrastructure at the depot and that grid to gate connection to make it work. Um, so initially we were looking at potentially going out of Stevenage into northeast Hearts and surrounding areas, but I think that would have involved about 60 buses, which have been almost double the funding and double the cost. So we've gone to 30 initially to really serve the Stevenage town centre area and a lot of those circular routes that you might be familiar with. Um, and I can send out a map for this as well, if that would be useful. The potential then is to use that as a catalyst to look at further areas outside of that. And I know the DFT are coming out with a decarbonisation plan later in the autumn. It might link into that as well. And but yeah, it's 30 buses in Stevenage Town Centre to start off with. And finally, on the timetables for rail, I fully agree. I think the network review we're conducting will hopefully tease out some of those issues and concerns around linking into other travel and making this integrated and truly integrated. It's a key thing that the DFT have asked for in the bus service improvement plan as well. So we do have to create some narrative around that, around our plans to link into rail and active travel from buses. So it's something we'll definitely be considering and looking at when we do that review. Thank you. Andrew, just a question for me. I mean, uh, the East Coast Main Line, I'm now the vice chair for this area. Um, they are having research done on timetabling and I'm just wondering, do you expect to be consulted um, on that for the, from the county's point of view, particularly on the bus timetables as well? I'll, I'll check with uh, my colleague, uh, Trevor Mason, because I believe there was some consultation on the East Coast mainland recently. I'll check if it's the same thing or different, but um, yeah, I'll double check that because it would be useful, definitely. Yeah, OK. Uh, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thanks, Phil. And uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, very good presentation, and uh, you know it's good good to see um, that the county council is doing a lot of work on integrated transport schemes. Um, I've got a question, two questions. Um, one question on, um, as you know, Andrew, very keen on the Hearts Link uh, uh, project um, that will really, hopefully, really benefit my area. I just wondered. Um, how can that work with existing community transport schemes? Um, is it, will there be an opportunity, for instance, for um, local schemes to to actually use the drivers app and the uh, the passenger app um, to uh, sort of enhance their own services and and enhance uh, the Hearts Links? Um, you know, obviously require a bit of training, etc. I think there's there's real scope there, I, I, particularly for um, a community transport project I can think of in my area. Um, so that that would be extremely useful. And um, just a, a question on the zebra scheme in Stevenage. You mentioned the 30 buses uh, in the pilot uh, project. 
are these going to be um, brand new electric buses or is this some sort of conversion, um, you know, dual, dual diesel electric? Just inter interested to know to know on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Yeah, on the first point, I know I know I'm really strong advocate for community transport as well. And I think community transport almost is the original form of demand responsive transport. The technology has just come on a bit, really. Um, so I'm definitely keen and officers are keen to look at how we can include that strategy with community transport. And I know we've already had one engagement session with local community transport providers to try and work out where the gaps and opportunities are, like you mentioned. Um, we have procured the technology, so I'd have to double check how that can be shared and in what instances and how we could set up possibly that mechanism. But I think the future strategy definitely looks at where on demand can fit in. And the benefit of on demand is the app really turns a vehicle into on demand very quickly, as long as a customer has a main booking uh, interface. So if there's a three hour gap somewhere or a four hour gap and we have local providers that we can set up a mechanism to work with, I'm definitely keen to explore that going forward and how we can do that. Yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah, very good. And just on the Zebra, um, these would be purely new zero emission electric buses. So the purest form of technology. We haven't quite gone to hydrogen and um, just because of the it is a lot more cost than what we were originally looking at. And we want to take almost that first step to get electric buses as part of the scheme. Our partners we're working with do have to keep those electric buses in the area for at least five years. Most electric buses, I think, have about an eight to 10 year lifespan anyway, depending on the battery. So we get really good use to get that annual CO2 emission down of 1,700 tonnes I mentioned. But yeah, they would be the purest form of electric bus. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Andrew, that's an interesting one. Surely after the five years or say eight years of life, we would be expecting the operators to renew to um, electric or hydrogen. We wouldn't want them to go back to petrol or diesel. So is there not something in there to give their get their commitment to that? It's a good point. I think I think the reason for the scheme, as I see it, is that financially the market's not quite there yet for operators to invest at the levels they need to invest in. And this is almost a bit of an acceleration thing, isn't it? So I think the hope that is in five to eight years, the market is there and the cost of an electric bus possibly comes down. I think the main price difference is for a single decker bus, I think you're talking about 180,000 going up to 350, usually for an electric bus. So there's quite a price gap there if you're investing in new assets. Um, but it is a key consideration, yeah, that we need to work with with our local bus operators about um, how they see the market and how they're going to continue going forward, because we don't want to just go backwards and have those 30 buses replaced by diesel buses again in five years. Um, so it's a key consideration we need to look at, definitely. But the hope is that volume will actually reduce the prices in the long term. Yeah. OK, uh, Steve, do you mind me calling you Steve to distinguish you from Stephen Giles Midhurst? I don't mind at all, Chair. I've been called much worse. Oh, that's all right then. I'll, I'll store them up for later. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Andrew, uh, for your presentation. Um, I found it very interesting, albeit I, I had seen part of it as uh, part of the induction. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, on-demand bus service, uh, DRT. Um, a very simple question. Uh, your presentation majored on using an app um, to use the service. Um, I wondered if you'd given any thought to, uh, and if you haven't, can you give some thought to how people that don't have the technology to use an app uh, are not excluded from using the service? Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned, we will be asking the operator. We're currently finalising the tender, but the operator we work with will help also have a phone line for people to make telephone bookings. So they'll use the app on their behalf and take a payment over over that way. So there is like, like you do with a taxi, I guess, and make a booking over the phone. There is still going to be that benefit to do that for people who aren't as familiar or want to use the technology. The other key thing we're looking at is how we can a make the technology as seamless as possible so people do feel comfortable and confident using it. So I think one of the big hurdles to get over is using it that first time and then, you know, going to the virtual bus stop, getting on the vehicle, getting to where you want to go and building that confidence. So we're going to look in the first few weeks at how we can encourage that as well for people who are a bit less confident. Um, but yeah, we'll have we'll have a phone booking system as well as sort of uh, a benchmark for people to use too. OK, thank you. Thank you. Richard, your hand was up and then it went down. Could you clarify if you want to speak? Yeah, it went up and went down because Stephen just asked, uh, Stephen just asked the same question that I was going to. Oh. Thank you very much. That. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, 
So we just need to note the presentation if you could put noted in the um, or otherwise in the chat, please. Thank you. Thank you, that's been noted. So we move on to item four, which is um, Steve Johnson to lead on the Highway Service Procurement 2024 proposed delivery model. Over to you, Steve. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Good morning, panel. So uh, Steve Johnson, Head of Highways Contracts and Network Management. Um, I wanted to take panel through um, a paper on procurement of the future highway service. So just by way of background, our current highway service is provided uh, by a range of providers engaged through a series of contracts um, at, with HCC staff as well. So we have an HCC client team. We have what we refer to as our two main contracts, our highway service term contract, which is with Ringway, our client support term contract, which is WSP Arup. And we have a series of framework contracts to deliver work such as surface dressing, um, bridge works, etc. Our two main contracts, so the Ringway and the WSP Arab contract, both come to an end on at the end of September 2024. So we need to re, uh, procure uh, new providers uh, from the 1st of October 2024 onwards to continu continue to deliver services. We've already extended both those contracts once and there is no option to extend further, so we have to re-procure. Um, although it's sort of three years out yet, uh, procuring a service of this scale uh, does take a long time. Hence, we start or we have started and um, making some good progress on that. In terms of the re-procurement, um, we've established a series of strategic objectives that we are looking to deliver as part of the re-procurement, and they're set out in Appendix A of the paper. Hopefully, a number of those won't come as a surprise to people. They're closely linked to things like sustainability, uh, the importance of delivering works and services for our residents and customers, etc. Value for money, efficiencies, uh, social value are all built into those uh, strategic uh, drivers that we're looking at. What we have done, we have we've been working with an organisation called Proving Services. We've identified a range of delivery models. There's around 20 de delivery models for delivering highway services. Um, we've been through a, a series of workshops to score those different delivery models in order that we come up with a preferred solution. Um, and the recommendation that we're bringing to panel today is that the future delivery model will be similar to what we currently have. So we're proposing that we maintain a highway service term contract. We're proposing that we retain a client uh, support term contract and a range of framework contracts to provide services within Hertfordshire beyond the 1st of October 2024. I would emphasise, whilst it's similar, we're not saying it's identical. Uh, this is only sort of the initial stage. So once we've agreed the delivery model, in terms of the next stage, um, we're looking at more detail in terms of the level of service that will be provided and how that service will be provided by those various partners. So happy to take any questions. Thanks, Steve. Questions, please.
But if there really are none, um, Chairman, I have put my hand up. OK, Paul. Sorry, it took me time to consider it. So, uh, sorry about the delay there. Just wanted to check, will there be an opportunity for member input as this goes forward? Um, you know, because obviously members are at the front face of dealing with highways issues. Uh, so what's required in the contract? Because it, you know, going forward, will there be the opportunity Sorry, sorry if it's a simple question. It's because I'm new and uh, still getting, you know, used to things. We have we have created a sort of working group, uh, which is uh, myself and three others from this panel, to actually feed into the um, service we want or the shape of the contracts going forward. Let's put it that way. It's quite quite um, understood that we inherited. Um, well, I inherited contracts which were basically based on a very stripped down budget, uh, which were based on safe and operational. Um, we very much think we have now got the opportunity to really take a root and branch review as to actually what we actually want our service levels to be. There are budget considerations. So one of the panel is going to be uh, Bob Deering, who's the chair of the resources. So it's quite important to have him on board because he's he's held the, the purse strings. But yes, there will be a member group going forward to actually, and I'm sure we will be reporting back to panel uh, in um, various stages. Yeah, can, can I just push you for some slight clarification? Obviously, the administration you know takes responsibility, so I understand that. Will there be a, a opportunity for the wider members to have a say further down the line? Well, to be perfectly frank with you, I mean we have operated MAGs before. That's member member advisory groups, which is cross party, basically designed to get cross party support for major issues like this. Um, I have to say, my experience going through the speed management strategy and the way that was handled, um, we've fallen out of love with bags and uh, we've decided as an administration that they're not the best vehicle. They they work well in practice, but unfortunately polit politics comes to play at the end of the day. So really, um, I don't think that was of any benefit at the end of the day, the way things turned out. So mags will not be happening for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Stephen. <clears throat> well, actually, I've raised my hand before you made that statement, which obviously was news to me uh, as leader of the opposition. I'm sure it's news to Richard as well and will be news to Judy, because that's the first we've heard that uh, the administration doesn't want to have cross party discussion uh, about issues such as this. Uh, and indeed, we have had cross party discussions about the way forward, which is why the conclusion reached in this report uh, isn't disputed I a very similar model to what we currently have. Uh, so I am concerned that you intend actually to progress this with no opposition involvement uh, in terms of the criteria. That is certainly going to lead to a very big falling out. Uh, and I suspect some other mechanisms will be used to ensure there is debate on this issue. Because that's the way you've just implied that there will be no discussion. It will be the administration that will decide the service criteria. Now, the, the disputes that we've had in terms of highways has not necessarily always been, although there are some issues and have been some issues with some of the contractors and subcontractors in terms of service performance. Um, but actually, it's some of the criteria that's been uh, uh, that the that the operators have to operate to i.e. the depth of the pothole, the width of the pothole and so on. Um, and of course, that isn't necessarily uh, the fault of Ringway or whoever in terms of not filling them, because that's the criteria laid down that they have to operate to uh, on the reporting mechanisms. Uh, and I would, would have welcomed a, a more, far more reaching opportunity to discuss this. And I've raised it, I'm going to use a parochial one, and I've raised it certainly, I mentioned it to Steve, uh, Johnson and others in the past, you, well, at the moment you have a separate criteria for on-road cycle lanes that are marked up on the road uh, for the rest of the road in terms of dealing with pothole. When that on-road cycle lane finishes, but the cyclist continues on road to the next section of cycle lane, and there's one on St Albans Road where there's about half a mile gap between the two of them. They don't go off-road because it's not... The, the criteria of fixing the pothole on the curbside 
is is different. That to me is something that does need to be addressed and looked at. And I would have assumed, I have to say, that a mag would have looked at these sort of things and indeed the financial implications. You're right, there could be financial implications uh, of doing so. But from what you're implying, Chair, uh, is that there will be no member op uh, opportunity to look at what will be the, the criteria uh, that whoever is going to be awarded these contracts. Um, and that is, to say the least, disappointing. And actually, I have to say, rather worrying going forward, because if the opposition is not going to be involved in that discussion, I can't see if we can support whoever is the new contractor. Whether we have a mag or not, it's not no guarantee you support that a decision anyway, Stephen. I mean, I would clarify that the working group is going to be from the administration, but there will be opportunity for the um, opposition to debate through panel in the normal way. So we're not precluding you, we're just precluding you from the working group because mags didn't really work. And I think if you um, really consider how, how the speed management strategy played out, um, you and Judy effectively killed off mags and we're not going to do those for this. Um, we're not designing the service now, um, although you're trying to give suggestions, we, we are designing the process through the, through the administration working group or debate at panel for the, in the next couple of years, Stephen. Is that a fair time scale? Yeah. Any more? Want, yes, I want to come back, Phil. Um, okay. We may have disagreed on speed management strategy, but as you well know, through the workshops we had on this one, we did not agree, disagree in terms of the format of this. Uh, and if you go back, because I've been involved in free contracts in relation to the highways performance, we haven't disagreed with the way we dealt with either of the two previous awards of contracts, uh, despite some uh, criticisms maybe from my side about who was the contractors. Um, so I am disappointed that you don't wish to have an all party involvement uh, in going forward on this. Uh, and on that basis, uh, my group will abstain on the vote on this because I think that uh, but solely on the basis you are now excluding the opposition from the discussion going forward in terms of the award of the contracts. I again, repeat, you don't seem to listen to what I say. You, there will be opportunity to debate through the cabinet panel in the normal way. Any more points or questions? Can I ask therefore, please, that you vote on the recommendation um that we are recommending to cabinet approve the proposed delivery model for the highways services under the next set of highway contracts please indicate in chat sorry phil it, it's uh councillor buttery i don't actually have the chat mechanism on on the device i'm using and my signal keeps dropping in and out so i do apologize to everybody but i would actually agree with uh stephen on uh giles Middlehouse on this so um if you can take my voters please that would be great thank you noted Is there a result, Teresa? Thank you, that's agreed. So we move on to item five, which is highways drainage. Um, Tony is going to lead on this, I believe. Okay. Good, good morning, Chair. Good morning, panel. Um, the report for cabinet panel is about the proposed approach to highways drainage over the next four years, making use of 10 million pounds of additional capital funding provided from the most recent IP and 6 million of revenue funding from funding that has been released to the highway service. That amounts to an additional 16 million over four years. And this paper provides information on the proposed approach to highways drainage 
and the actions the highway service will take. It brings together information that was in the IP in a report on highways asset management from earlier this year that outlined a review of our work on drainage and it includes information on how we intend to use the revenue funding that has been released to highways. The aim is to improve the ability of the existing drainage system to better cope with the changing nature of rainfall as a result of climate change, to consider opportunities to modify or upgrade the drainage asset, and to consider options for some locations where there is frequent highways flooding and risk to properties. Can I apologise to the chair and to the panel for a mistype in paragraph 7.2 um, where it refers to 5 million of revenue, it should be 6 million, um, so that it matches the table in the report. My apologies for that typo. Uh, the report explains that, cab that panel is invited to recommend to Cabinet that Cabinet notes the planned use of revenue funding that is outlined in Section 6 and the actions outlined in Section 7. Um, I don't know if Chrissy wanted to add anything to that before we get into questions or not. No, OK. <laughs> Over to you then, Phil. Um, over to the panel for any questions or comments. Don't be shy. Stephen. Yeah, can I, can I have some clarification here? Because the table in paragraph 6.2 refers to 8.5 million of revenue funding. Uh, and the paragraph uh, above it in um, uh, 4.3 again refers to that, but also refers to the original 11.3 million of, of central cap, uh, of capital grant from central government uh, and the 2 million that was allocated for resurfacing works. And that original, so there's two questions there, sorry, I'm probably going a bit too quick here. The 11.3 million was allocated as additional ma maintenance money uh, for the government in 2020 um, the, the administration uh, used some of that to, to prop up the over cost overruns on the A602 scheme and others. The rest of that money was due to be allocated um, for resurfacing works on other roads. Now, do I get, I, I need to be clear here that that, na that money is now going to be put in instead of resurfacing and pothole work into drainage work. Now, it's all going to be used on the highway, except that at the end of the day. So I just want to add that clarification. That that's the intention of paragraph 4.3, because it's not totally clear. And the 5 million or the 6 million are now talking about against the 8.5 in paragraph 6.2. I'd also like clarification as to the timelines, because this is referring to <coughs> a capital grant of 10 million for 21, 22 to 24, 25 and implies that the revenue is equally spread over that period of time. And certainly at the briefing meeting we had, you understandably said you couldn't necessarily uh, do this work all in one year. You'd have to plan out when it was going to be done. I totally get that and understand that. But can we have some timelines as to when we can actually see some of this work, assuming it is agreed by Cabinet, will actually be delivered on, on site, so, so to speak? So are, are we talking no planning work the remainder of this year, but actually delivery 22-23? That's the first set of questions. I may want to come back, Chair. Thank you. OK, so if I pick up on the financial questions first, Chair. Um, there we had some, every council was given additional funding by DFT in 2020-21, and that's the 11.3 million or so that was mentioned in paragraph um, 4.3 of the report. We held that back as contingency funding for the major projects because the major projects have some significant overspends um, due to COVID. The department, we've made requests to the Department for Transport to cover the additional costs of construction as they related to the pandemic, uh, but to date we haven't received any assurance they will do so. Um, so at the time we held back the 11.362 million. Um, we were intending to spend it on a range of different highway uh, maintenance um, outputs, including resurfacing, but a range of others as well. Um, with the changes in the IP, finance have found a way to release um, eight and a half million of revenue funding to us. Um, and so that's why we get to the eight and a half million, because we had the, we start off with 11.3. Some of it was spent, as Stephen said, on the some resurfacing works on some A roads and on some additional maintenance works on the A602. Finance have given us eight or released to us eight and a half million of revenue funding. 
We're intending to spend six million of that on drainage and some of it on some other um, aspects of highways, which is outlined in the table later on in the report, which is why we talk about the eight and a half million, because that's the total revenue envelope. But of that six million, we intend to spend directly on drainage. As to when works will start, we, we outlined in the in the paper that came to Cabinet panel in February on the highways um, asset management plans, the, the drainage work this year will be mainly investigation and preparation. And because it takes some time to plan this property to make sure we get value for money. Um, we're expecting to see some minor works start to take place later on in the summer. Um, but this year is primarily going to be an investigation and preparation. As to a profile over the next four years, uh, we don't know that detail yet. That's part of the reason why we're doing a review and having a, a good look at this to make sure that we do get value for money over the next four years. Um, it's worth reiterating, this is a four year program and we're in the start of that four years. I think I picked up on all the questions. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, just, just, just clarification on this. So the government money was capital money, 11.3. So we ha we've only we haven't spent that, so it's bank. But you've asked for permission to use it. Is that what you're saying? And then you've actually you've converted that to revenue, or someone in finance has converted that to revenue. That's what I that's what I'm missing. Or is in fact that capital money still sitting uh, in the coffers, so to speak, still to be used on highway schemes? That's what I'm not clear about in the paragraph 4.3, and what your explanation is. Um, I'd have to get finance experts to explain um, how the money flows, Dean. I, I can't do that. We don't have 11.3 million sitting anywhere in coffers anymore. Um, effectively, what was the 11.3 million? Some of it was spent on research. Yeah, I get that. So we've got eight and a half left, yeah. which is where the yeah. eight and a half comes from. The eight and a half that's left has now been given back to highways, not as capital, but as revenue. But as to how finance achieved that, I'd have to get a finance expert right. to explain. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, Rena. Thank you, Chair. Could I just please ask a couple of questions? Um, I think a lot of people have probably find this um, funding welcome, especially with what's happening in rain and drainage. Will we be looking at uh, the effectiveness of past projects or the past use of capital to make sure that we got value for money and also that we can see what worked and what didn't and then don't do what didn't and then possibly revisit what did. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about is with some of this funding, would it be possible to put together perhaps some public awareness campaigns in terms of not only climate change and what's happening with the rainfall? I think you know it might fascinate people not shock them to know that on some days we're getting as much rain as we normally expect in the month. Um, I've learned a lot recently about you know, householders who may put the porch drainage into the um, foul water and what the implications of that is on the system. And also a colleague of mine reminded me recently that there are only three P's that we should be flushing down the toilet and nothing else. So I don't know if that would be timely at this point, especially you know, working with schools uh, as well as our residents to make sure that we do all that we can to help in every way that we can. And the last thing I just wanted to ask, we know that there are some areas that are uh, at risk of repeated uh, flooding or drainage issues. When we see the forecast of uh, heavy rain, is there any kind of action plan we put in at that time or is there any kind of program that we might need to look at. So if we are expecting torrential rainfall, we're on high alert in some of these more vulnerable positions or can do something for the future to be in that high alert. Thank you. I'll, I'll take those, Tony, should I? So with regards to um, past projects, uh, we won't be carrying out a formal review of past projects, past capital works that we've done, but we do um, do an after scheme review once projects are complete. So if we've come across a system or a, a piece of equipment or a, some material from a drainage point of view that didn't work and, and we understand the reasons why, then we won't use it in the same situation again. Um, so hopefully there's some reassurance there that we are learning as we go. With regards to a public awareness campaign, it, it's a really, really good point um, and it's something that we've talked about and, and the three P's that you mentioned, um, as well as things like um, property resilience measures, uh, for people in, in um, risk areas, 
we, we don't intend at this stage to develop a big um, comms campaign, but we are working on smaller um, bits of information to go out on social media through highways um, and also part of our drainage service review or drainage strategy review, which is noted in the report. Um, part of that is about how we get better communications out to our residents um, that will include that kind of thing that you've mentioned um, and um, anything else that's that's relevant and those little snippets that are a bit of a light bulb moment once you hear them. Um, regarding preemptive responses to flooding, that's something that our flood risk management team um, have certain sites and areas that, that they will keep a monitor on and keep a check of the weather um, and, and they lead on that from that point of view. From a highways point of view, we don't preemptively um, plan for um, areas that may or may not flood in uh, once we understand the weather reports. I think that was the three. The awareness campaign, I mean, I know we're not planning anything at the moment, we're doing a lot on active travel at the moment, but um, I might have a word, I will have a word with comms on that, Christian and Tony, to see what they think about putting something together. So I know they're keen to sort of take on these sort of campaigns now for public awareness, so that'd be good, good suggestion. Um, Jeff. Excuse me a sec while I, ah, oh, there I am. Um, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Tony. Um, just referring to um, in 7.1, the proposed actions, the capital works um, that you'll be putting together for the drainage schemes. Um, will there be or is there an opportunity for members to contribute or, or check really that areas that they know within their division um, uh, have uh, flooding and drainage issues. Um, is there an opportunity to contribute um, to that? I know obviously you'll be using um, the, you know, the fault, fault reporting, um, etc. for that, but um, it would be good to know. I'm thinking in particular, I mean, um, it could be as simple as um, s sending members uh, a list of schemes that you are, are going to be looked at. Um, I'm thinking quite often, uh, well, very often, uh, we give reports to parish councillors, et cetera, as a county councillor, and it would be very useful to update that if there's a particular, and of course, known drainage problem in that area to uh, to let them know that it's been um, included in, in the scheme. Thank you. Yeah, so so the, the route for schemes to end up on the capital programme um, it, not always, but in generally it, it goes through either a CAT 1 or a CAT 2. So it's identified as a, a reactive response that we then do more investigation. And if we can't resolve that through CAT 2 works, we will then take it to the next stage, which will be um, the capital type stage. So that would be the CAT 4 bigger schemes or the CAT 6 sort of mini schemes. Um, so the key thing really for, for members is to make sure that the information is logged on the fault reporting system. Um, that's kind of our first part of call and that gives us our local intelligence. The other thing to bear in mind is that capital schemes are pro uh, published on the IWP. So members will get a monthly bulletin that shows what capital schemes are happening. Um, and on top of that, um, the uh, revenue type works will be delivered through a, a CAT 2, CAT 6 kind of program. So that means that your local DSA and your local AHM will have an awareness of those sites and locations. So your usual communications with those is, is the best route to get that information. OK. All oh, right. Fine. OK. Thanks very much. Chrissy, are you are you happy that generally speaking, and I, nothing can be guaranteed, that we are aware of the hotspots around the county? Yeah, so it's a good question. We know what we know, you know, um, so so the more things that are reported to us through the fault reporting system, the, the better our asset knowledge is. Um, so I, I couldn't look you in the eye, Phil, and say we know all the hotspots. Uh, that would be remiss of me to do that, I think. But if, if members have been talking to their AHMs and DSAs, etc., about issues, they would definitely be on our radar. Whether or not they come in the mix of things that with the funding, we know about those sorts of issues, don't we? Yeah. 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 And I would just reiterate that, you know, if any members have got a worry that, you know, your local issue isn't being covered, then do speak with your DSA and do speak with your AHM just to make sure that you, you flag it with them. OK, thank you. Annie. 
Sorry. Yes, thank you very much, Chrissy. I was building on Jeff's question there, really, um, in terms of um, 7.6, improving the drainage, drainage data, asset data. And then um, I don't know what other members feel, but there are times where, obviously, same with comms, people are only really interested in flooding when it rains a lot. So that's the time to actually get that information out. And this year has been a, you know, a great example of that. But in terms of um, our reporting uh, or and or fault reporting, uh, the, you might know where these areas are, but it'd be really good that we could perhaps learn um, Appendix 1, um, you split into um, subgroups, some of the issues. So um, things like carriageway or footway gullies, retention ponds, roadside grips, ditches, whatever. And I assume there's different treatment that's possible for different issues. So, for instance, there's going to be areas in rural patches where I'm sorry, but it is the farmers fields and the ditches are all we've got to cope with. But if we could have some sort of audit within our uh, areas, I, I mean, we've got four years, but it would be so much easier when we're trying to calm down our, uh, our, our residents. And you know, we're able to do that quite well now with potholes and um, you know the, the temporary surfacing and then the full surfacing. But if we can understand more in our patch what those areas e each are, I think that would be a huge help to us. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I don't disagree with that. And it's, it's one of the key points that you've picked out of the report, that our knowledge of our asset inventory isn't brilliant. You know, we've got a good database of our gullies and we've got good um, knowledge and, a, and a, an approach to those that's a risk based approach. We don't really have that for any of the rest of our asset. Um, we've got information, really old information that's on various formats, microfiche, believe it or not, plus paper drawings, plus lots of other things, transferring those into a digital format that would enable you and us to have better understanding of where everything is is part of our drainage service review or our drainage strategy review you know we we absolutely acknowledge the fact that we know where the gullies are but we don't really know where much else is and and that causes us not to be able to build um, an efficient asset management life cycle model type approach to managing our drainage assets so in the way that you're you're able to explain to residents about potholes we can't give that information at the moment about drainage because we don't know enough about it um, whether we're able to do that in the four years with the funding that we've got I suspect that that's unlikely um, but we'll also need to have a think about um, what systems or platforms we might need to start logging this information on um, it doesn't necessarily suit a linear type platform that lots of our asset inventory data is currently stored on yeah, I'd like to challenge that a bit four years um, because this has become pretty apparent, particularly with the rainfall that we've had. Um, and I, I don't know what level of detail it has to go to, but I said just to help with our conversations in terms of what we press on with, Chrissy. I mean, there are some people who said I've been complaining about this for 20 years and we'll find that they probably complained 20 years ago and not since. Hence your point about it's on microfiche or uh, uh, I don't know vellum or whatever it's on. So I think um, you know I think well let's ask members if they want a more interactive um, help with this one going forwards. Frozen. Oh no no sorry sorry I was I was looking at Phil but of course Phil you 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 can't see that can you my apologies. Um can I just clarify that. What you're referring to is about improving the drainage asset information or is it about um, fault reporting? Well, I see that I see the two together that, that basically it's like having an audit within our own divisions in terms of our flood risk areas in terms of those that we can do absolutely nothing about and we just explain that that will come and it will go others that are uh, uh, old pipes that are all, all these different all these yeah. different things is we only learn it often when we actually have an issue with it yeah and, and, and i think and it okay. can take weeks to even get any information back so yeah and, you and it, it once and it's somewhere and it's somewhere on a you know somewhere on um a, a mapping system perhaps would be the best way yeah then, yeah yeah, I understand. Thank you. Um, and, and absolutely. I, I don't disagree with that. It would be brilliant to, to do it once and have it stored somewhere. Having the resources to do it that once is is our difficulty at the moment. Um, 
we would need to go into every single every response that we do every drainage issue currently has a bespoke response that is we need to go and investigate it um, and we need to decide what the problem is we need to consider the bigger surface area whether that has an impact or not or whether it's just a localized yes you know it might just be there's roots in the pipe for example you know and that will tell us that potentially every five six seven eight years we'll we'll need to go and do some root cutting it might be actually that the the water that's falling in that environment that surface water area is too much the volume is too much for the pipe work and of course replacing pipe work to take more water is a, a very different scheme and a very different challenge for us um so i think i would still say we're, we're back to where we were before i couldn't guarantee you that i could come into your area at some point in the next four years and review the whole area the whole of the surface water and all of the highway drainage assets by the end of those four years to give you or, or put you in a position where you would know all of that information and we would know where every single one of those sites that we can can or should do something about is two things it took us quite a long time to actually map the gullies that we got didn't it chrissy uh, 180,000, and even some i'm sure we don't know about but, but hopefully most we do know about but surely when we do our investigations, we will be looking at individual drains and we'll be building up a database from there. Absolutely. Anything we learn, we'll be keeping that information. Um, yeah. But we, I, I can't guarantee to you now that by the end of the four years, we will know where every drainage drain is and every gully is and every soakaway and every catch pit and, and the condition um, and the need for each one of those. OK, thank you. OK, Annie? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Phil. Yes, I think, you know, as you said, there's, there's, there's a lot of historic information, so it'd be yeah. interesting to see how much we've got, but yeah. thank you. Uh, Paul? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the issue I've got, um, obviously, problems change day to day, week to week, month to month, you know, and some of that is down to the maintenance of the drains. Uh, a direct question, I don't know if Anthony can ask, this which is how many VATA units does the county have to maintain our drains at this time because I notice in the figure in 6.4 I think it is uh, we're talking or 6.2 the table we're looking to hire some back to time uh, I mean I have reported an issue in one road in my own division where there's seven drains five of which are blocked if we don't keep up the maintenance with it, we cause our own problems going forward. So it's understanding, you know, how many VACTA units have we got? Why are we only looking to hire? If we haven't got enough, should we not be looking with capital to purchase another one so we can keep up with the maintenance? Thank perhaps you. Chris, perhaps Chrissy can enlighten you and us on the difference between a VACTA and a norm bog standard gully cleaner and how yeah. many of those we've got. Can I just interject before Chrissy does that, Phil? Yeah. Just to answer part of Paul's question. Um, each year, Paul, we, we regularly clean about 129,000 gullies. Um, so the five that are blocked in your patch um, should be on a regular routine maintenance schedule. And that, that routine schedule depends on some historic data we've got on silt levels and how often things need to be attended to. Um, so I just thought I'd explain that first. So they should be picked up on the routine things. And usually if there's surface water, it's not often that it's just the drain that's the problem. Usually it's something underground that's the problem. So we, often people will say to us, oh, the drain's obviously blocked. That's the cause of the surface water. Um, it can be, but more often than not, it's not. And it's actually something underground. But I'll hand over to Chrissy to explain about the yeah. factors and hiring. Sorry, I'm not being rude, Chrissy. I, yes, normally the drains were cleaned, uh, cleared. I, I understand on a regular basis. For some reason, it didn't happen this year. I have reported it on the system. So oh, I, thanks, will, Paul. I should get an answer back somewhere along the line. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we had, with, with the pandemic, we had to cut our, our annual programme from 129,000 to 90,000. Um, well, we managed to achieve 97,000 in the end last year. Um, so there may be some in your patch and elsewhere that we couldn't attend to because of the, because of the pandemic. So over to you, Chrissy. Thank you. Um, so we, we have one back to unit um, that our contractor has on our behalf um, and it's it's a, 
a, a big all singing all dancing it's it's high pressure it's got lots of power um, and we use it um, in line with their or in, in conjunction with their cctv unit as well um, and the vector unit comes with all sorts of attachments it might have um, the, the chains that basically spin at high speed inside the pipe that that, that cut the um tree roots etc cetera, etc cetera. It, it is massive when you see it you will know it we have three gully carts that run the um cyclical gully emptying program that um, Tony was just talking about um, and those are a bit smaller and, and aren't quite as high powered and don't come with all the attachments to, to try and help resolve because what we're expecting those to do is a much more sort of mundane routine um, job. We did consider whether we should purchase a VACTA unit for all of the reasons that you stated um, and when we tossed up um, how much it was going to cost us and then how much it would cost us in maintenance, insurance, um, training etc cetera, etc cetera, as well as the fact that it was going to take 18 months for one to be um, constructed for us because they're bespoke pieces of kit um, so they get built to order effectively um, and we didn't want to delay for 18 months whilst we waited for one of those to be built um, and the balance came out that it was better for us to hire rather than purchase a piece of equipment. Thank you. I think I know there's a lot of confusion about what's a factor and what's a, a gully cleaner, but hopefully that's clarified for you. Um, and Steve had his hand up again um, and it went down again. Steve, are you up for a question? Is, is that me, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I do have a question. Um, um, it, it's going back to the VACTA unit. Um, I, I do have a little bit of experience of this in a in a former life, uh, so I know I understand a little bit about um, this type of equipment. Um, firstly, I'm quite surprised at an 18 month lead in time, although I, I've been away from it for a little while, so uh, it, it may have progressed onto that kind of time. Uh, but I'm still surprised why you would consider um, it better um to hire in equipment when um there isn't really such a thing as an on-demand hire you can't um call somebody today and say can i hire a vector unit tomorrow um and um, my worry with that would be that it would delay um any um works that you may need to do um i suspect you're probably talking about um, you know, a two or three, maybe even four week lead time on, on a higher in VACTA unit. Um, and whilst you might use that as a short term measure, I would still have thought the longer term, um, it, it would have been better to have bought a unit and then you are in control um, of your own destiny in that regard. Yeah, it's it's a fair point and you're absolutely right. They're not standing there in, in the subcontractor's yards waiting for us just to, to ask for them. I think one of the driving factors is that we're trying to plan a planned program, an efficient program of work. So we would be looking to hire rate with a program of works, um, which is one of the reasons that we're trying to pull all of our asset intelligence together. Um, and the reason why we're saying that we will be starting work through the summer of this year, because we're just not quite ready to start now. We don't have that data and that intelligence. Um, forgive me, was there a second question there? Uh, no, but there's a second question coming, <laughs> um, if you don't mind. So, um, yes, on the back of what you've just said, and, and I, I get the bit uh, about um, planning the works. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a real advocate of, uh, you know, prevention is better than cure. Um, and uh, it is better to, to plan these works. But inevitably, uh, you will have circumstances where unplanned works uh, are required um, and, and again for me I, I still think uh, further consideration needs to be given as to whether having that second piece of equipment available to you uh, when you need it rather than in four works time whether that's a better option. Yeah it's a fair point and I think I think perhaps that's better for us to consider more strategically through the drainage strategy review when we have a look at how many instances we might want to have a, a reactive factor unit um, and, and our knowledge of the asset starts to improve so i'll tag that onto the drainage strategy review and we'll consider it in in the round in the hall yes and, and i guess of course that's for me at least that's the data that's missing at the moment it may well be that there aren't that many unplanned works 
uh, in which case all of what I've just said um, w would seem redundant. But but nevertheless, I, I still think it, it's better that you're masters of your own destiny in this regard. Um, and, and it's worth re reviewing um, whether or not um, it would be better to have a second unit yourself. I mean, that existing factor really goes out on emergencies. Am I right in saying that, Chrissy? It's normally planned work, following investigations, etc. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We do tend to use them just for planned works. Um, yeah, 100%. Yeah. In okay. James. Are you with us, James? So save a pregnant pause. Did, did you want to come back, Stephen, because your hand's still raised? Yes, yes, I did. <clears throat> on, on, <clears throat> firstly, um, on the Vatican unit, the 1.4 million that you're allocating to that, um, yeah, you may well be right about hiring it in. I, I know using the existing one via Ringway, uh, when I've had when they agreed to actually send it out to a certain site, it's been a six to eight week wait because it's in use elsewhere in the county or indeed not even in the county. But I think what's more important, fine, we're spending 1.4 million. But I assume that will include staff time, i.e. the operators. If you're hiring it, there'll be, there'll be the personnel to drive it and operate it. I suppose it's how much usage we get out of our 1.4 million um I, I, not obviously chrissy you won't be able to answer it now but it, no it, uh, will that mean it's a thousand hours or is it a hundred hours or or what what i think that's what's more important i how many gullies will we end up getting for our 1.4 million uh cleared out i think it's something that uh, i would like to know and i'm sure other members would be interested to know in due course, and I appreciate you will not be able to answer that question now. I certainly didn't give you any notice of it. Um, 7.5 refers to a review to consider various things, including obviously other organisations. Uh, and I think we have to accept, um, uh, and although County may get uh, undue blame on occasions for flooding, some of this actually is the responsibility of other bodies, such as Thames Water and the Environment Agency. Uh, and Chrissy, you'll be well aware of the water lane issue. Uh, that's that, that caused it to be closed for nine days. Uh, the main route, a main route between Bushy uh, uh, and Watford, and many. And I've now had on-site visits uh, with officers. Uh, but obviously, a lot of that is down to the failure of the Environment Agency to actually dredge part of it to make it actually usable. In fact, our pumps are now going to have to be lowered because they're in, you know, because the water levels get they get blocked up with debris and so on. Um, but obviously, how robust can we be with these other bodies to actually to solve some of the drainage, the big serious drainage problems? I'm assuming as part of, and obviously the money we've got here probably won't, clearly will not solve all of them. No matter what what you put into it, won't solve all of them. But really, what is the relationship on that, and how forceful can we be? Because um, the works that are being planned by <coughs> Ringway have been explained to me aren't going to be cheap in Water Lane. And if, and if the environment agent don't do the work, they won't, if we get another deluge, uh, like um, Brent, uh, like we had in central London yesterday, Water Lane would have been flooded this morning, quite clearly. Um, and finally, in, in relation to the appendix, and it's been touched on a little bit, but to some extent it's almost buried in the appendix, and this is over the routine services. Um, I thought we'd moved away from the 24 month cycle and we'd moved back to an 18 or 12. So it was a little bit of surprise to read back in here that the 24 month cycle is back on, on the agenda where the silt levels are recorded as good. And I suppose it's an understanding and perhaps an ex a more detailed explanation as what are good silt levels uh, or where silt levels are recorded as average or poor. Because uh, that's 152,000, 153,000 gullies are uh, just under the, where silt levels are recorded for. They're not sorted out in 18 months. So I suppose it's having examples as to what is classed as that, maybe even on the fault reporting system, uh, which I know was down this, this weekend in terms of reporting gullies. 
Um, uh, no, no, is it, no so a resident or uh, I take a photograph of the gully. Now, is that considered to be uh, poor or is it average or what? And therefore, what is the expectation that I have to wait the, that it will be dealt with within 18 months? And it might actually be 18 months before it's dealt with or it's 24 months. Yep. So if I pick up the um, the robustness and, and how we work with other authorities, um, we don't. We can try enforcement with with other bodies and other authorities where we have the powers, you know, and, and primarily that's under the Highways Act. It doesn't always get us the right results um, and, and it can be really costly for the council. Um, and, and actually, we might end up in a position where we're no further forward and no better off for, for many, many reasons. What we try and do is is work with them in a more collaborative way. Um, and I think one of the things that, that is covered in the report talks about how we might start to better improve communications with other bodies and start to better work together to solve the problems that we've all got. Um, it is a really complex issue. You know, from a highways drainage point of view, we will always start by looking at the outfall. If an outfall is in a river and a river is in flood, the highway drainage isn't going to work because the water is not getting out of that pipe. If the outfall is blocked, if it's a trash grill, you know, there's, there's, you always start at the low end. And, and if that low end happens to tie into somebody else's asset, we are relying upon them to be doing their maintenance, whether that's routine or ad hoc in the same way that we do. All of these other bodies have the same really difficult decisions to make with regard to prioritising where their works go. Um, and, and we also know in the case of the Environment Agency, for example, you know, by, by dredging a section of river, it can have an absolutely massive effect on the next county or two counties down because actually the, the water then is flowing past that river even quicker. So the Environment Agency have got an even wider um, area to consider. Um, so I think I think trying to understand all of their challenges as well as ours and getting the best for, for Hertfordshire and the highways is how we'll always try and approach these things. But it is bespoke and it is ad hoc. You know, every time we have an issue, we, we need to have those conversations and and try and see where our works or, or the works that will impact us and, and benefit us fit in their bigger, wider programmes. Where there is instances that we do need to carry out enforcement and we think that that we should be doing that, we work really closely with Steve, who's, who's Steve Johnson, our Steve, um, and his team and our lawyers um, to make sure that we can do our best and get the best for the county um, in those instances. Regarding the 24 months and the silt cycles, when we empty the gullies, what we do is measure the amount of silt that's in it. And then next time we go and empty that gully, we will measure the amount of silt again. So if we empty, in the really simplest of terms, if we empty gully A at, at year one and it's full to the top, that will be the recorded. If we go back in two years time and it's full to the top again, depending on what, what the flood risk in the area is, we might then say, actually, that gully should be on an 18-month cycle rather than a 24-month cycle, and vice versa. Um, and, and, of course, you know that we have vulnerable gullies, et cetera, as well. So the way that we determine the silt is by measuring it when we empty it. So it's it's a factual measure rather than a, a visual measure. It's fair to say also, Chrissy, that we've got a six- and 12-month cycle as well for more vulnerable gullies. Yeah. And that is that, and that is actually basically um, indicated on the pop-ups on the thought reporting system as to what, when the next cleaning um, is scheduled. Isn't it? Yeah. I'll give James. One, one question. Sorry. Uh, yeah. one question. Can you hear me now? Super gullies. Could we? There was two sites identified. Could we have a little bit more information about these two sites and the super gullies, please? Yeah. Can that be done offline? Thank you. Um, so, James, are you still? Are you with yeah, us? Okay. Can you right. hear me now? Yes, we can. First, let me apologise, Mr Chair. I had some issues, computer issues getting in. Um, and also, I'm a newbie, so bear with me. I'm learning a lot as we go along. I have a question for Chrissy. Um, you say that when you have issues that have happened several times or been reported seven times, several times, you know it's a hot spot. Um, although this is not in my area it is my adjacent area at QE2 for eight or nine times I've seen uh, equipment coming to try to clear the drainage only to find when moderate rains come across Ascot Lane it literally fills the whole road this is becoming a dangerous situation because at night time you can't see it and also you've got the ambulance and uh, and numerous other issues 
Do you have a map of where you have consistent issues? The short answer to that is no, um, we don't. We uh, can do hotspot mapping post a rainfall event. Um, and part of the future improvement works that we'd like to do from a drainage asset point of view is to understand where we have these regular flood sites. Um, and, and that's part of the drainage strategy review. Understanding the reason why they are repeat floods and whether that's something that's within our control from a highway authority to, to manage and resolve or whether it needs a wider, more complex multi-agency resolution is, is also important. Um, and, and there could be many, many reasons why place why that site and many others um, have repeat flooding. Sometimes it's that we haven't been able to get there and do the work. Sometimes it's that the, you know, the outfall is, isn't working or, or can't work because if it's linked to a river, the river levels may be high. There are so many reasons and that's part of the difficulty we have with drainage. It's a really complex part of our highway asset and the works that we have to deliver. And, and, and I wish there were, but there isn't. Uh, there's no simple answer for every single one of those. Um, so I, I will need to do some more research with, with Ascot Lane specifically. Um, but in general, and in response and, and for this panel, understanding our drainage asset and, and being able to um, better plan our works and know where we have got hotspot areas is part of the drainage strategy review, basically improving our drainage asset knowledge. I appreciate that. Um, my contact for my area is Jason Ball, and I think the chap is Ollie for the other side. Now, he's been and visited it, and I'm sure if one looks at the backlog of the repairs done there, and I've seen several, none of them have worked. We're wasting a lot of money in that area, but more importantly, it is adjacent to the hospital. It's a key road for entrance and exit of the hospital, and it's becoming extremely dangerous. I just wanted to highlight it, and I apologize if I'm out of order, but that's how I see it. Thanks very much. So I think if it's all right with you, Chair, I'll take that offline and pick that up with the teams outside of this. Please, I appreciate a, that. A parochial issue that can be taken offline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, OK, no more questions. Can I ask panel to um, support the recommendation? Well, I, I do notice it says the planned use of revenue funding outlined in Section 6. Are we not basically agreeing to the planned use of all the funding, including capital, Tony? Um, yes, but the member cap capital was um, went through cabinet through the IP process, and so the, the recommendations. IP, yeah, the IP was agreed. Either the money was released, but we we didn't agree how we were actually going to use it. And I, and I thought it's all now in a, a pot for us to use. Oh, I see. Yeah, but you, we could you could change the recommendation if you want to, Chair. So I propose then, uh, if you're listening, Theresa, planned use of funding and the actions outlined in section seven. Is that okay, Theresa? That's fine, Chairman. So um, I'll take that as an amendment. Yes, and thanks. members could um, vote first if they're happy with the amendment. Yeah. If you could do that, please, in chat. OK, so thank you. That's been agreed. So we now vote on the amended um, recommendation.
That's been agreed. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to go through without a break. If everyone's agreeable, we take item six now. The Winter Service Operational Plan 2021-22 and Salt Bin Policy Change. Um, uh, Richard Stacey, I believe is leading on this. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, welcome everybody. My name is Richard Stacey. I'm the Assistant Network Manager uh, in Highways, and one of my main responsibilities is the Winter Service. Today's report, it's quite a lengthy one, so I'll try and go through it quite quickly. Um, there's first of all, we've got uh, the recommendations at the top there um, regarding uh, that we recommend the winter service uh, operational plan, which we have to do each year to cabinet and the new salt bin policy. There's then a summary of how many outings that we had last year, which was 78. For reference, we had one of the coldest uh, Aprils we've had on record, and we actually went out six times in April, which is unusual, very unusual uh, to go out in April at all. Um, the, the winter service operational plan uh, is basically the same as it was in previous years, and we've kept in the amendment that during a pandemic, myself and Phil could agree any route changes to take in test and vaccination centres. In regard to the new salt bin policy, this isn't designed to suddenly put out loads more uh, salt bins on the highway, although we are going to allow members a one off to fund a bin, and although it's not stated in the report, the costs of a bin can vary year to year because it depends on supply and demand. But for a, a commuted sum that would include five years salt and supplying of the bin and getting it on the highway, this would be in the region of 800 to 1,000 um, pounds. The new salt bin policy um, goes through, as I say, members can put a one off two new bins in and it's come up with a criteria um, to allow us more intelligence. We've started gathering intelligence around salt bins. If we go one year and they're full, and the following year we go they're full, that bin isn't used. So through this criterion, only can we get uh, the possibility of a new bin through the member, but as I say, up to that, still up to that maximum, but we can move the bin to another area if it meets the new criteria. I'm happy, I'm off after today's meeting until the Monday, I'm on leave, but I'm happy to take any parochial issues outside of the meeting. And I'm also happy to supply any member. I've had a couple of member requests for new members to ask could they have a map of their uh, area and what the routes are. Um, I'm therefore happy to take any questions, please. Stephen. None of these will come as a surprise to Richard because we had a, a meeting last um, uh, last week, um, and it's a general point. Uh, share surprise actually to some extent on the previous one. Um, it, it, I have to say I, I don't think it was terribly helpful the way the report was written. In that the appendix four is, ta is a page ninety of the report, which it, it actually details the change of policy. And that is actually part of the change of the policy. Um, so, I mean, I have read it and I, I do understand going forward. But actually, the change of the policy is also paragraph 411, as well as Appendix 4. And the recommendation should be changed accordingly. Um, I think it may even, pre, um, may even be pr your predecessor, Phil. The policy was changed. It did not allow members to use their highways locality budget to install grip bins on the highway that was removed from members a number of years ago so this is a change of a policy which should be welcomed to allow us to back to use that if we so desire and it's detailed in paragraph 411 of a maximum of two new bins per division including the community sum which obviously Richard said so that really needs to be in the recommendation because the previous policy hasn't yet been rescinded unless you put that in the recommendation uh, we were allowed to use locality budgets to install them off road for community groups, but we weren't allowed to use our highest locality budget. So um, I'd like that changed in that recommendation, please, to add that in. And similarly, I've no issues with uh, Para 313 to allow you to, as a matter of uh, national pandemic, remote to change, because uh, clearly that does need to be done. But if there are changes to those routes, can we add on to that recommendation 
and the appropriate local member brackets members are so informed. I think it's only right and proper that if you've made a change to the routes and understandably you've done it for justifiable reasons, that the first the local member knows is not actually when X resident rings up and say says, why are you gritting my road or more likely why are you not? But the local member actually knows that that has happened and indeed obviously the obvious reasons operationally why that has occurred. I don't think any of those any of those suggestions are unreasonable. Um, so I suggest changes to both power three one three and uh, power three one four to reflect actually the report and obviously the suggestion I've just made, Phil. I hope you can agree to both of those. I've written in the, the bit on three and the local members informed. Can you just um, repeat yeah, what three you're one thinking four, in for? 314 should refer not only to Appendix 4, yeah. uh, but paragraph, I'm trying to find it again now, scrolling up and down my screen. Um, yeah, 4, 11, 1 and 2. Which refers to say silt bins funded through the member highways lower academy budget, uh, including a community sum for maintenance purposes, but limited to a maximum of two new bins per division. Because that is actually not in Appendix 4. Appendix 4 is the criteria for putting the bins in, but doesn't say a member can only have two. Okay. Uh, and obviously, the second part of that is the silt bins funded through new developments where new highways to be adopted by the authorities. Concerned. I think that is important to equally have that in, that we do expect new developers, developments that to provide salt bins um, and I mean there is the bone of contention. The other points I have raised um, with Richard is who decides the severity of the gravement and the severity of the bend in the road but I think the, the answer I got back and Richard will confirm whether this is correct or not well that's a matter you probably would want to discuss with your HLO uh, and you have that robust discussion on an individual site basis. If that's correct then yes. OK, I've, I've made a note of those two amendments. I'll check Theresa's got them when we get to the voting. I'm, I'm happy with those. They make sense. Uh, uh, just come back on that, Phil. Sorry. Uh, One thing that Stephen said then, and of course, it is rescinding the previous policy, which wasn't in the wording because there is a previous policy. So this replaces it. If we put a power oh, of this. Supersedes or receipt. Uh, supersedes. Yeah, whatever, as long as it's very, very clear. <coughs> yeah. Paul. Cool. Uh, just a couple of uh, things. I mean, one of the requests for where my salt bins are and where the routes are are from me. So um, I'll appreciate you're on holiday till next week. Uh, what I wanted to um, you uh, was adding on to what Stephen said about the salt bin route changes. Uh, sorry, the gritting changes. We also need to know if you're going to remove a salt bin because it might be happily we think, oh, we've put it there. Then you say after the two years um, you, you remove it because it hasn't been used. It would be helpful for us to know. That's one thing. The other thing is the accident record. Is that purely serious injury or does it does it apply to accidents because bumps and scrapes you know could lead to something more serious going forward so it, it's how, how we assess the accident and also on on the accident uh, for pedestrians slips falls trips um you know where we're putting them in residential community areas uh, for safety uh, is that addressed please thank you Paul, um, yes, I'm happy to provide the uh, the maps there for you. Um, equally, um, yes, any salt bin moves, uh, I'm keen to always involve members and, and to work with them. And that is why the new criteria is out there, because it does give you the ability that if I if I come to you or you notice and we say that there's a bin in your area that's always full and you say, can I move it to location X through this new criteria, we can do that. In regards to accidents, both vehicle related and pedestrians, we can only go on what is reported uh, to us. And that might be uh, through the full reporting system or where somebody has put in a claim, be that successful or not successful. And that's standard practice across the UK. We do look and work very closely with our insurance section where any issues have been raised uh, uh, like that. 
Okay, thank you. No more hands that I can see. So if we can go to the recommendations, um, Theresa, tell me if you're happy with these. Under three, I've just um, made that semicolon and a comma and then put, and the local member is informed. Under four, I've um, altered the end to take away the brackets and it reads salt bin criteria in appendix four and paragraphs 4.11, one and two. Full stop. This supersedes the previous policy. Are those clear, Theresa? Can you just repeat the one for 3.4, please, for um, security? Uh, right. Remove the brackets at the end of the sentence and complete the sentence this way. In Appendix 4 and paragraphs 4.11, 1 and 2, full stop, this supersedes the previous policy. That's fine. So if we can vote on the amendments, please. Fine. Thank you, Phil. OK, the members agree. So if we can now vote, please, on the amended recommendations, bearing in mind one is just a noting, uh, just that we've commented on that. So. Okay, thank you. That's agreed. So we move into item seven and the other part one business. There is none. Um, there's no part two business. So I'm pleased to declare the meeting closed. Thank you all for your attendance and particularly thank you to Teresa and Carly for keeping us all in order. So thank you girls and uh, see you all next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.